magic on this world. Satan is making plans to rule the world. Kind of like pinky in the brain, you know. God's up in heaven laughing about it. Psalm 2 is a great tranquilizer. When you, the more you study about what's happening in the world, in the new world order coming soon, the more nervous you can get if you're not careful. Just read Psalms 2. It'll calm you right down. It's a good tranquilizer. Why do the heathen rage? The people imagine vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. God is laughing at their plans for a new world order. You want to read some good books, read the seven men who rule the world from the grave based on their philosophy. What you believe determines how you behave. That is for sure. Okay? Or if you want to know some things you can do about it in America to help slow things down, be sure to get this book about jury nullification. You know, one person on the jury can just vote not guilty if they don't like the law. The question is not, are they guilty or not? The question is, is the law reasonable? I don't like that law. Not guilty. <laughs> Amazing book. You ought to read that. It's just a dollar. Henry Morris has an awesome book <clears throat> about, called The Long War Against God. That is a must-read for anybody studying creation and evolution. It's a bitter fruit coming off of an evil tree, folks. Evolution is also the foundation philosophy for the new world order. There's an excellent video you can get from our ministry, Megiddo, Megiddo 1 and Megiddo 2. You want to study the, what's really going on and get, get the whole philosophy of what's happening so you can get the big picture. I recommend call our ministry and get those. We just ordered those here recently. or lots more in our college class, 103. Evil men have already divided up the world into regions, and they've got it all planned. They want to rule the world. Their goal is reduce the population to a half billion with a few of them as the, right, you know, the, the elite get to rule the world. There's a committee of 300 that basically pulled the strings. We cover, we spend all day talking about that. don't have time tonight. But they've got their plans to rule the world, you know, like Pinky and the Brain. What are we going to do today, Pinky? We're going to go take over the world. It's what we always do, you know. <laughs> God's in heaven laughing about it, okay? If you want to study some of the conspiracies, if you get into that kind of stuff, there have been numerous conspiracies. Get the Medusa file or the American Conspiracy, uh, New American Magazine, the conspiracy, to see what's really happening. We could spend a long time talking about that, uh, about the conspiracy. There's the Committee of 300 that really are controlling and pulling the strings, or the Illuminati, top, 300, top 13 bloodlines of the Illuminati, the super rich bazillionaires, the rich who want to rule the world. But that would be for those who want the red pill only, for those who've seen the Matrix. What they do is they, they develop a crisis intentionally so that they can bring in their solution to the crisis. That many events like the Civil War, World War I, the 1929 Depression, they are intentionally caused to make people come in and cooperate, whatever the reason may be. Okay? The 29 Depression was to make everybody get a Social Security number. That was the purpose of that. Cuban Missile Crisis was intentionally done. Okay? Oklahoma City bombing was intentionally allowed to stop the militia movement going on here in America. Call Ben Parton, the Air Force uh, explosives expert. He says, that, that no truck bomb blew up that building. The pillars were sheared off. That was C-4 explosives wrapped around the pillars. Many folks are convinced the government was involved in taking down the building in Oklahoma City. And same thing with the Twin Tower bombing. Go to a, get, the, get the website, 911inplainsight.com. Has anybody seen the movie In Plain Sight? Anybody seen that? David Rockefeller said, We're on a verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis. And the nations will accept the new world order. See, God has plans for the world, and so does Satan. And Satan's plan is no people here, or maybe just a few, and a one-world government. The Bible says perilous times shall come. The people will be fierce, despisers of those that are good. Christians are going to be absolutely hated. You can already see the animosity toward Christians on TV. You know, if, if there's a bad guy in the movie, and he's an axe-wielding person, you know, beating everybody up, it's always somebody quoting Bible verses, isn't it? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You know why he's out there killing people. They make the Christians and preachers look, look awful on TV. One of the groups to really watch in this plan for the New World Order is FEMA. Boy, they have taken over my city since the hurricanes. <laughs> There's just no question. They are in charge, all right? Just keep an eye on that group. George Bush told the Iraqi soldiers they should disobey if they're given orders to poison gas, to use poison gas, or blow up wells. He said, because after the war they're going to be judged. Okay, American soldiers... You took a vow to defend the Constitution against enemies foreign and domestic. 
If you get an order that goes against the Constitution, you better disobey that order. So I'll get court-martialed. Yeah, probably so. You do what's right, okay? Who's doing this? What's going on? And what do we do about it? Okay. There are all kinds of people involved in this plan toward a new world order. The United Nations, the World Council of Churches. If you go to a church that's a member of that, get out, okay? Council of Foreign Relations, CFR, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, the International Bankers, the Club of Rome, the Communists, the Socialists, National, NEA, National Education Association. Get out of that bunch if you're in it, okay? Uh, now, uh, or ACLU, or the Masonic Lodge. Most people in the Masonic Lodge don't realize what they're in. They think they're in a do-gooders club. And it won't be till it's too late when they realize, wow, this was a satanic organization. Uh, General Albert Pike, 33rd degree Mason, leader of all the Masons years ago, said, this, what, this, that which we must say to the crowd is, we worship a God, but it is a God that one adores without superstition. To you, sovereign grand inspectors general, we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Yes, Lucifer is God. When the Mason learns the key to the warrior on the block is the proper appliance of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. And before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly handle energy. Good book on the Masonic Lodge. This one you can get from chick.com or get it from our ministry. If you call there, we'll get you some. Excellent book on Masons and what they really, really are for. Okay, what do we do? Real simple. Exactly what Jesus told us to do. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them, you know, get people saved and teach them to go do the same. You realize Jesus grew up in the middle of the Roman Empire? His country had been taken over. He didn't spend one minute trying to change the Roman Empire. He went after people, win souls. Hosea said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. What do we do? There are perilous times coming to this country and to the world, real serious times. I think probably real soon. I'll be really shocked if we make it five more years. I'm going to be surprised. What do we do? Well, what we need are some men and women who have understanding to know what to do. What should we do? The Bible says, For the transgression of the land, many are the princes thereof. But by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. I got four grandkids. Man, I want to prolong the state. I want them to have some freedom and peace to grow up in also like I had. What do I do? Deuteronomy says, take you wise men and understanding. Well, we need some people with understanding. Solomon prayed and said, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern, discern between good and bad. Do you want to have understanding? The Bible says Abigail was a woman of good understanding. And beautiful. Uh, don't hurt, you know, throw that in too, but okay. They sent him men of understanding. He's, uh, Ezra, chapter 8. By the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding. And the children of Issachar, Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. I wish we had some politicians that had understanding of the times to know what America ought to do. I don't think we have too many. Most of the politicians, you know, Cut their finger in the wind. Hey, which way are you blowing? Which way is the wind blowing? I'll lead. <laughs> we need some statesmen, not politicians. You know what politics is. Poly means many, and a tick is a blood-sucking animal. But, okay. Okay. I think it's time to get motivated, folks. I don't know what you're doing, but I, it's, it's time to get really moving. We are rapidly running out of time. What do we do? Okay. Number one, you need to realize God's in control. Don't get nervous. Get busy, but don't get nervous, okay? Where he's the potter, we're the clay. Do what he says. Simple, okay? We should be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Be careful for nothing, full of care. Don't get nervous. Just get busy. We should pray for those in authority. See, if you were praying for your senators, you would know their names. Wouldn't you? We're his children. Our job is to obey him. Preach the gospel, okay? We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. Did you know salt does a lot of interesting things? Salt preserves. You should be a preserving force in your community. Salt irritates. If nobody's irritated at you, you're not a good Christian. 
You say, Brother Hovind, you know there's a thousand anti-Hovind websites? Oh, I know, ain't it great? <laughs> We're going for 2,000 this year. You ought to be irritating somebody or you're not doing it right, okay? We should use your influence on other people. Our local uh, science, director of science curriculum, I called down there uh, years ago when I was trying to change the curriculum in Escambia County. She was a raving evolutionist. She said, Mr. Hoven, you are the only person who calls in here and complains about the evolution in the textbooks. I thought, where's everybody else? There's 128 Baptist churches in Escambia County, Florida. What are they doing? We're supposed to use our influence, man. Read the, people say Christians shouldn't get in politics. Oh yeah, tell that to King David or King Solomon, okay? You should teach the truth about creation. One of the greatest ministries available today, I think, is a creation ministry. Find something to do. People will sit and listen to a tape about dinosaurs or creation that will never come to church for any other reason. Won't they, brother? If you're getting into it now, awesome. You should, the two great sermons in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, Peter preached, you know, on the day of Pentecost. And he quoted scripture after scripture after scripture. He's talking to Jews. That's the way you talk to them. They want to be reasoned with from the scriptures. Acts 17, they go to Mars Hill. He's talking to a bunch of heathen that don't know anything about scripture and don't care. He, Paul didn't quote one scripture in that whole sermon, Acts 17. He said, I want to talk to you about the unknown God, the creator of the universe. God that made the heavens. He used creation to win them. Number nine, don't get distracted. It's so easy in this world, especially in America, to get distracted. How many have ever seen these little mobiles you put over the crib? You wind it up and the kid lays there and goes, oh. <laughs> It's so easy to get distracted. Do you know the average American watches 1,500 hours of TV a year? That's enough time to read your Bible 22 times. I don't think you have to read your Bible all the time, but I mean, you ought to read it some, you know? Speaking of watching TV, Psalmist said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Uh, do you put wicked things in front of your eyes? What if you made a rule around your house that if you hear a cuss word on TV, you're going to shut it off for two hours? What if you made a rule that said if you see somebody who's not modestly dressed, you're going to shut it off for two hours? If you see somebody drinking alcohol, you're going to shut it off for two hours. How much would you watch? Oh, well, we could all cancel that cable and we could support 45 more missionaries just out of this room, couldn't we? Bible says, for the transgression of the land, many are the princes thereof. You know why we got so many bureaucrats, so many rules and regulations? We're wicked. This is God's judgment. <laughs> all this heavy-handed government is God's judgment on our country. We deserve it. Righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Here's the solution. You want to help save America? It's real simple. Here's the solution. If my people, which are called by my name, shall vote Republican, join the militia, and stir, store up survival foods. <laughs> uh, it's not quite what it says, is it? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Hey, dads. When's the last time your kids saw you humble yourself? Hey, when's the last time your kids saw you come to the altar and pray for somebody? When's the last time your kids saw you pray for anything? When's the last time your kids heard you say, I'm sorry, I was wrong? Moms, when's the last time you humbled yourself? Kids, when's the last time you humbled yourself? When's the last time you told your brother, look, brother, I'm sorry, I was wrong, forgive me? When's the last time? Humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn off their wicked TVs. Or, no, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. You want God to straighten out this mess? He'll do it. He's waiting on us. We do our part, He will do His part. I like this story. Eliab, David's older brother, Talked a little. David came to deliver the cheese and the raisins and stuff, you know, to the army. Eliab said, uh, what are you doing here? Why did you come down here? Go back and feed the sheep. And David said, is there not a cause? Uh, brother, that big old Philistine's out there cursing your God. 
What are you doing back? Go take his head off. Is there not a cause? Man. Little David has come from taking care of the sheep, sees the big old giant and says, somebody ought to shut him up. He's out there cursing the God of Israel. And Eliab, his big brother's yelling at him, shut up, brother, go back home, take care of the sheep. We're the soldiers. Is, hey, is there not a cause? What is your cause? What do you live for? There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who's striking at the root. What's your cause? Is this it? A ball? You just can't wait to get home and watch the game. Got to watch that 300-pound gorilla carry a football down the cow pasture, run through the plumbing, get six points. Wow. And the angels rejoiced. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. Strange. The guy who's third in the nation racing motorcycles got saved in my seminar up in Connecticut. About a year later, I was preaching up there, and he said, Hey, Brother Hovind, let me take you to breakfast tomorrow. I want to tell you what's been happening in my life. The Lord's really changed me in the last year. I said, That's great, brother. Let's go. He said, I'll let you test drive one of my bikes. I said, Okay. He uh, took me to breakfast. Afterwards, he backed out of his trailer, you know, his Honda 900 that had been blueprinted and stroked and bored and balanced, and I'm not sure what all they did to it, but I've got a Honda 250. He said, try it. I got on there and boom, took off, about broke my neck in first gear, you know. Hit second gear and boom. I was just about to drop it down to third when I glanced down and realized I am going 90 miles an hour in second gear. It has six gears. <laughs> I wound it down, brought it back. I was shaking like a leaf. I said, how fast does it go? He said, I don't know. Guess, guess what he wants? He wants a faster bike. People that love speed shall not be satisfied with speed. People that have 80 pairs of shoes in their closet, you know what they want? More shoes. People that have a big house, guess what they want? Bigger house. People that have lots of money, guess what they want? More money. Why does it take us a whole lifetime to figure out things on this earth do not satisfy? They won't. They'll never satisfy. It just won't do it. Hey, did you know, if you spend $500, you can buy a nice set of golf clubs. And then if you're willing to practice for thousands and thousands of hours, you have to get the grip just right. This thumb and finger make a V. Point that toward the left shoulder. This thumb and finger toward the shoulder. Think fingers laced or not laced. Either one will work. Knees slightly bent. Shoulders curled. Club face perpendicular to the ball. Bend the right elbow first. Left elbow shortly thereafter. At about 15 degrees, left elbow bends. Okay? If you are willing to practice for thousands of hours and really dedicate yourself, someday you will be able to knock a ball into a hole in the dirt. <laughs> and the angels rejoiced. Heard a story about the preacher, called his assistant, said, I need you to preach for me this morning. I'm, I'm not feeling very well. Preacher went golfing. You heard that story, brother? Yeah. <laughs> Devil's up there talking to the Lord. And the devil said, hey, Lord, see your preacher out there? He's golfing on Sunday morning. Lord said, yeah, I see it. The devil said, what are you going to do about it? He said, Lord said, I'll take care of it. Preacher tees off and a hole in one. The devil said, Lord, what are you doing? I thought you were going to fix it. The Lord said, I did. Who's he going to tell? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I think we ought to quit worrying about the things on this world, folks. They're all going to burn. It's all going to burn. If you're risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Set your affection on things above. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father. It's of the world. The world passeth away. It's all going to be gone. It's all going to burn. Hey, do you know how much Howard Hughes left behind when he died? All of it. <laughs> Every penny. You're going to do the very same thing. Don't invest your life in things that are going to burn. Last thing we need to do, almost last thing, listen for the trumpet. 
1 Thessalonians 4. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ rise first. Southern Baptists go first, but we're going next, okay? Oh. <laughs> then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. It's going to be great. Meet him in the clouds. Number 11, win souls. Find somebody you can win to Christ. Jesus was born, did his whole ministry under Roman control. Paul got taken to prison under Roman control. What did he do? Well, let's win the prisoner to the Lord. Win the jailer to the Lord. Just win souls. He that wins souls is wise. Most important thing I think a Christian can do is right there. Win souls. During the Civil War, a big old country boy signed up to go fight the Yanks. You know, they come down here invading our country. I'm going to go fight them Yanks. You know, he got his training, got his boot camp done, got his backpack and his rifle, and sent him off to battle. He showed up and said, reporting for duty, sir. Where's the Yanks? Sergeant said, son, the Yanks are right over there. They're dug in a trench, and we're dug in a trench here. Nobody's moving. We're waiting for orders. You, your job, son, is to march in the trench right here. He said, Sarge, I didn't come to march in no trench. I come to fight the Yanks, and they're right over there. Can I go fight them, please? He said, no, son, that's not the way it works. You march in the trench. When we get orders, then we attack. He's marching back and forth. He's getting madder by the minute. He said, man, I didn't come here to march in the mud. I come to fight the Yanks, and they're right over there. How come I can't go fight them, you know? Finally, he just, he just he couldn't take it anymore. Totally went berserk. Dropped everything, jumped up out of the trench, and ran <laughs> screaming and yelling across no man's land, straight for the Yankee trench, all by himself. A one-man rebel charge. The Yanks were stunned. What? Who is this guy? Nobody thought to shoot. You know, he ran all the way across no man's land, jumped into the Yankee trench, picked up the first Yankee he saw, and boom, knocked him out. One punch. He's a country boy. He'd been toting, hey, man, he's hefty duty, you know. Picked up his prisoner and ran back for the rebel trench. Now nobody dared shoot, you know. He got back in the rebel trench. All the rebs gathered around and said, what is that? He said, that's a Yankee. He said, well, where'd you get him? He said, I got him over yonder. He said, there's a whole bunch more over there. He said, y'all could have had one if you'd have wanted one. Y'all could have had one if you'd have wanted one. You know? So I think we're going to get to heaven, and some people are going to have a, a whole crowd around them of people that they influence for the Lord, you know? They brought them to Christ, they trained them, they got them going. And some of you, are you're going to be there, you're going to heaven, but you're not going to have a, nobody with you, none, zero. You're going to walk up to somebody with a big crowd and say, where'd you get all these? Oh, uh, I got them down yonder on the earth. Y'all could have had one if and you'd have wanted one. You just don't want one bad enough, do you? You're really more interested in the weather channel than uh, the neighbor going to heaven. Well, I've got to see if it's going to rain. And what are you going to do about it if it is? Huh? <laughs> okay. You're not going to affect it any. What on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Last thing I recommend you do, read the last chapter, folks. Keep in mind, we win. It's going to get real bad. People say, Brother Hovind, you think the Lord's coming before the Great Tribulation? Uh, I hope so. I don't know. I couldn't prove it from Scripture. There are at least five theories of what happens in the end times, you know, post-trib, mid-trib, pre-trib, millennial, all that stuff. I've studied them carefully as I know how, and I can't figure it out. I'm sure hoping for pre-trib rapture. <laughs> so were the Chinese Christians for the last, you know, 60 years. So were the Russian Christians. So were the Ethiopian Christians and the African Christians over the last 15 years that have been killed by the tens of thousands. I don't know. I hope we get out of here first, but uh, I wouldn't, don't think I can prove that from Scripture. Either way, do what God told us to do. Win souls. Jesus is coming one of these days. He's going to set up his new world order. Satan has plans for a one world government, and it's going to last about seven years, according to Revelation and Daniel. It's going to, he's going to have one. Then the Lord's going to come wipe it out and say, now I want to show you what the real kingdom looks like. And all of you that have been faithful, here, you can have this city and you can have the whole county. And here, you can have that whole state. You've been faithful, son. I'm going to give you the whole country. You're the boss. You going to be there? One of these days, the Lord's going to bruise Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. God wins in the end.
I saw the angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Till the thousand years were finished. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Is that how it's going to end for Christians? Maybe so. They had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Oh, I can't wait for that day. Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst come. Come. If you're not a Christian, come. Let somebody show you how to become one. If you're one of God's children and you want to find something to do, come. Ask Him, Lord, what do you want? What can I do? He'll find something for you to do. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. If we can help, that's what our ministry is for. We want to bring people to Christ, win souls. Nothing else is going to matter. In a thousand years, nothing else is going to matter. What are you doing for the Lord with your life? We hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6.23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask Him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. And forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, if you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help. For more information on other materials offered by Creation Science Evangelism, call us at 850-479-DINO. That's 850-479-3466 or visit us online at www.drdino.com. That's www.drdino.com.